praise the Lord, everyone. And we bless the name of the Lord for this new day and for this opportunity again uh, to reflect on his word as we begin the day. As our sister has said, our topic this morning is unbelief, an element of darkness. And taken from that reading, the gospel according to St. John chapter 8, from verses 12 to, to 20. Let us pray as we proceed. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your love, for your care, for your protection, for your mercies that are new every morning. We thank you, Lord, for again waking us up this morning and giving us the opportunity to sit at your feet as you continue to speak to our hearts. So this morning we pray that as we listen to your word, may your Holy Spirit have his way in our lives. Lord, I pray that you use me as a vessel to convey your word to all of us this morning. I pray that you give me clarity, Lord, as I share your word. And may you help us to understand in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Um, our topic once again is unbelief, an element of darkness. Um, many of the people who have shared, especially within this week, have been talking about uh, light and darkness. And I do believe that uh, at this point, we do understand well what darkness is all about. It is not the, the physical darkness that we see maybe at night, but we are talking about spiritual darkness. That is uh, more to do with the sinful nature of man, the things that are opposed to our faith in the Lord, things that are against the will of God. We know from the sharings that we have had that Jesus Christ is the light that came into this world to lighten the darkness that uh, was in our hearts. And so every person who is not in Christ Jesus has not experienced this light, but is still continuing to live in darkness. Their souls darkened from the truth, the light that is in Christ Jesus. But I want to briefly uh, explain what unbelief is. My friends, uh, I looked at quite a number of explanations concerning this word unbelief. But I, I zeroed to this, and it says unbelief is the absence of faith. Simply put, it is basically the absence of faith. It is the state of not believing, especially in matters of religion. So where there is no faith, where things are done without faith, it qualifies to fall under the state of unbelief. Unbelief is the absence of faith. And friends, the writer of Hebrews gives us a warning in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, that see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from God. I repeat, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from God. And so it refers to a heart that is unbelieving as sinful. Actually, as Paul writes to the Romans in Romans chapter Chapter 14 and verse 23 says, But whoever 
has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. Now, I'm more so interested in the last part of it that says, everything that does not come from faith is sin. And so we can actually say this morning that unbelief is sinful. It is actually sin. And so, friends, whereas faith draws us closer to God, unbelief turns us away from God. That is why the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And the writer of Hebrews in 11, 6 adds that anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who honestly seek him. And so this morning, as we talk about unbelief being an element of darkness, I want us to remind ourselves that where there is unbelief, instead of drawing closer to God, we are drawn far away from God. However, we shouldn't confuse unbelief with uh, doubts. You know, doubt is something that manifests even in the lives of believers, but we should only be careful not to allow our doubts to translate into unbelief. And so unbelief is a condition of a person's heart where you have made a decision to live your own life as though there is no God at all. And that is why we are saying that unbelief is an element of darkness. From our text today, I want us to look at some of the things that led to the unbelief of the Pharisees. Let's go to our text, the gospel according to St. John, chapter 8, from verse 11. What were some of the things that prompted the unbelief of the Pharisees? And if we are not careful, today's life also, if those elements are within us, might cause us to have lack of faith in the Lord, a state of unbelief. The very first thing, friends, that I want to highlight is actually stated in verse number 13. John chapter 8 and verse 13 says, The Pharisees challenged him, Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Friends, the attitude that the Pharisees had towards Christ generated their unbelief in him. Their focus was on finding only faults in Christ Jesus so that they could actually disprove him. And that is why when Jesus Christ you know, spoke to them and tells them that he's actually the light of the world, whoever follows him would not walk in darkness but would have the light of life. The Pharisees challenge him and say that because you are bearing witness of yourself sorry about that I think I am praying <laughs> Again, their focus was mainly to find an fault within him so that they could disprove of his ministry and make themselves to appear better than Christ. So that instead of people following Christ, people would rather follow them, the Pharisees. Friends, sometimes. We are also caught with this kind of attitude as the Pharisees possessed. We find that we have people who come to worship. 
Many people who claim to be belonging to a particular group of worshippers, of or, you know, members of the church. But sometimes we come with different reasons that draw us to this group of, you know, uh, believing uh, Christians. And some people just want to find false others. Their aim is to criticize everything that is taking place. Whatever is happening, they do not mind whether it is good, they do not mind whether it is the truth, but they just want to show that they actually are better. They know more than the people that they are criticizing. They are better than the people whom they are criticizing. And this is exactly what the Pharisees were doing. They wanted to appear to be better than Christ Jesus. And therefore their aim was to look for fault so that they would make Christ to appear as a false teacher before the Israelites. So that is one thing, friends, that blocked their hearts, that closed their hearts from the truth of the gospel, that closed their hearts from Christ Jesus, who is actually the light that has come to shine forth in the darkness that is in this world. So every time we look at false, every time we focus on criticizing people and we can not see any good that is in them, we close the doors of our hearts to the different opportunities of proof that are being presented by them. And so this made the Pharisees' hearts to grow cold towards him. But also, the other thing concerning their attitude was based on the background of Jesus Christ. When, when you look at uh, chapter 7, uh, <laughs> Chapter 7, verses 40 uh, to Kelito. Uh, chapter 7 and verses uh, 40. Listen to what he said. Chapter 7, uh, verses 40 says, On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Others ask, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Just listen to that, friend. How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Now, to these people, because the Bible records in in Matthew uh, chapter 11, that Jesus Christ, actually that is during the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. When people were wondering who is this man, and the crowd responded and said that he is the man from Nazareth of Galilee. And so because Jesus Christ uh, uh, is reported to have come from Galilee, these people were like, no, 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 no. It cannot be possible. There is nothing good that can come out of that place. How can a Messiah come from Galilee? What we know is that a Messiah is supposed to come from the lineage of David and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived. Now, the fact that Jesus Christ is associated with Galilee, there is no way he can be a Messiah. And so on the account of his background, the Pharisees could not believe anything that Christ Jesus was saying. Sometimes, friends, we also, uh, you know, judge people based on their backgrounds. And even if they are presenting the truth, even if they are on the right track, but simply of the background that is associated to their life, to their lives, we start to oppose them. And so because of the negative attitude towards Christ, basing on his background, the Pharisees closed the doors of their hearts because they could not believe that the Messiah would actually come from Galilee. Friends, the attitude that we have towards the Lord, the attitude that we have towards God's people, the attitude that we have towards the gospel can actually lead us into a state of unbelief because we shall question many things. We question not with the attitude of learning more or coming into faith, but our questioning is to try to disprove what is actually true. And so, because the Pharisees knew that Christ was from Galilee, because they knew that, you know, 
he, he was a, a son to a carpenter, it was hard for them to believe that anything good could come out of Galilee, that, a, that Christ could actually be the Messiah. And so their hearts were blocked from believing in him. What is my attitude? What is your attitude towards God, towards the things of God, towards the people of God? Because friends, if you have a negative attitude, that negative attitude can actually lead you into a state of unbelief because it will prompt you to ask questions. And these questions that you are asking, actually, yes, it is good to ask questions if you are asking with a desire to learn. It is good to ask questions if you are asking to know more. But if you are only asking so that you may find fault, so that you may show that you know better, you are better than the person that you are actually questioning, then there is a problem. You are most likely to land yourself in a state of unbelief. And then the other thing, the second thing is, friends, the, the obsession of these Pharisees with their religion. In that very verse, as they tell Jesus Christ that your witness, because you are witnessing by yourself, your witness is invalid. They were speaking from the point of view of their practices as uh, the Jews in their Judaism, their religion. Because they knew from the laws of Moses that a testimony can only be established if it is of two or three people. But without that, it was invalid. And so when they looked at Christ Jesus and they thought that uh, he was acting contrary to what was stated in their religion, they were not about to believe what, the, what he was actually saying. And so friends, when it comes to the issues of religion, there are many Christian practices, there are many Anglican practices that we have. Unfortunately, some of us are satisfied with Anglican practices, the traditions as, that we have as the Anglican church, but we do not make an effort to go beyond these traditions so that we can actually establish a faith in Christ Jesus. We are comfortable attending church you know, services. We are comfortable attending the activities that are, you know, are for church, but we hide our hearts away from the King of Kings and we feel like what we are doing, the religious practices that we are embracing are actually enough to, to save us are actually enough to help us be on uh, God's good books. But I want to let us know, friends, that you can defend religion just as the Pharisees did, and you miss out the most important point, and that is to do with our salvation. That is in no any other but in Christ Jesus and Romans chapter 9, uh, verse 30. Listen to what Apostle Paul says from verse 30. He says, What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith, but the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness, have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Friends, the Israelites, the, the Pharisees embraced the law. They fought to defend the law. They did not want anything that could be done against the law. And in so doing, they missed out the most important thing that they could actually ever receive. And that is the light that Christ brings, the light of our salvation. Simply because their minds were focused on defending the, their religious practices. And even as today, we can slip into a place of only being religious, of doing, performing all the religious 
rights, you know, rights that we have to do as, you know, as Christians, having a relationship with Christ Jesus. Now, Paul says that the Gentiles who were not actually seeking this righteousness, they obtained it because when it came to them, they embraced it with faith. But for the Jews, they thought that their belonging, you know, uh, to to the to the nation of God's people, they thought that by having the laws of Moses, it was enough to make them righteous before the face of the Lord. But Paul says they missed it because their, you know, honoring, observing the laws was not actually done in faith. I am not saying that these religious rites are wrong, but friends, if you, you look at these religious practices as the end to themselves as far as issues of faith is concerned, then there is a big problem because we are going to slip into the place of unbelief that if there is anything that pertains to Christ, the things of God, if they are not aligned to what we know as part of, our religious practices, we are going to oppose. And that is why every time any new thing comes up, any new revelation comes up, we fight it. If any, if the trend of worship changes, we rise up and we fight it simply because it does not align with what we know as, you know, the practices of our church. And so for the Pharisees, their obsession with their religion made them to slip into a place of unbelief. Now, because Christ was teaching something that they believed was contrary to what they knew, they opposed it. They rebelled against it. Could it be possible that somehow, somewhere, we are actually fighting to defend you know, our practices, our religious, you know, rights, other than defending the truth. We can do this blindly and think that we are doing God, you know, service. And yet we are like these Israelites who missed out. And when they missed out, the Gentiles who were not actually seeking this righteousness are the ones who later on embraced it because they did so with faith. And so friends, when we only embrace mm -hmm. religious practices without the element of faith in it. We can do everything, but at the end, mm -hmm. the Lord, away from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Why? Because he tells us that not everyone who calls him Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of God, but only those who do the will of the Lord. Now, if you have and believe there is no way you can walk in the will of God. You will always oppose godly things. You will always oppose the ways of God. You will want to operate in a way that pleases your heart. That is against the will of God for his people. And so friends, much as we appreciate religion, much as we appreciate you know, the sense of belonging to a community of believers, let us refrain from things of, you know, defending the man of God that we subscribe to. Let us refrain from defending the religious practices other than defending the truth that is in Christ Jesus and him alone. If the practices contradict the truth of God, then we should refrain from those practices and instead embrace Christ Jesus, who is the truth. And so for the Pharisees, their religion, their religious practices blinded them from the truth that was in Christ, the light that was in Christ. And that is how uh, their unbelief was actually promoted. The other thing, friends, is that these people lacked experiential knowledge of Christ. Now, Christ told them in in verses uh, 14, as they questioned him, Jesus answered them, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you have no idea where I come, I come from or where I am going. Friends, the Pharisees thought that they knew Christ. Actually, that is why they, they made a statement earlier on in chapter 7, as we saw, that can a Messiah come 
you know, from Galilee because they knew the background of Christ Jesus. They knew how he grew up. And basing on these accounts, they thought that they actually knew Christ. But they lacked this experience with Christ. They lacked this knowledge that comes through an experience with Christ Jesus. And because of that, they continued to operate carnally. They resisted the truth, the light that was in Christ Jesus. Friends, you can know about God. You can read the Bible. I have met many people who actually know the word and they can quote very many scriptures. I have met people who can sing so many hymns of head, but all these things, the knowledge that they have concerning God does not translate into their lifestyle. And as a result, they, you know, their lifestyles are alienated from God. They actually continue in a state of unbelief because they have not opened their hearts unto the Lord. Jesus challenged, uh, he challenged his followers, he challenged uh, the Jews in John chapter 5 and verses 39, John 5, 39 and 40. He told them that you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Now, these people soaked themselves in the word of the Lord, and they thought that in that they were going to have eternal life. But now Jesus Christ is telling them, the word that you actually revere so much, you study diligently, they testify of me. And therefore, they are supposed to lead you to faith in me. But instead, you refuse to come to me and you end at a point of just having these scriptures, thinking that by holding on to them, you have life. Friends, we may read the Bible, we can know everything concerning the church practices, but if we do not know Christ individually as our personal Lord and Savior, then there is no way we are going to walk in faith in him. Instead, our lives will be defined by unbelief. And that is exactly what was happening to these Pharisees. They lacked an experiential knowledge of Christ Jesus. They only had the head knowledge. They only had the knowledge concerning what they knew about Christ being born in their midst, you know, how he grew up. And because of that, they despised a relationship with him because he was not adding up to their standards at all. And so friends, sometimes also we get caught up in this kind of, you know, knowledge, head knowledge concerning the ways of God, the things of God. But if we don't have this personal relationship with Christ Jesus, we might think that we know him. We might think that we are walking in the light, but we shall be deceiving ourselves because at the end of it all, it is only this experiential knowledge of Christ that will help us to walk as believers in him, that will help us to walk in his light. But if we do not have this experience with him, we shall continue to walk in darkness. And then the other one is sin. Friends, sin promotes unbelief for fear of being exposed. Uh, before this text that was read to us, the Pharisees actually brought a lady who was caught in adultery and they wanted to hear what Christ, the, the judgment that Christ had to give concerning uh, her sin. But when Christ challenged them that let any one of you who is you know, without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. These people, one by one, they disappeared. Now, where there is sin, friends, sometimes we fear being exposed. And because we do not want to be exposed, we close our hearts, you know, from the Lord. We remain, we, we find all ways of justifying what we are doing. There are people, when you, you know, when you talk to them, 
but simply because probably there is something they are engaged in that they know that it is not right. It is not right to do it, but they do not want to leave. They want to continue because maybe it is a source of their livelihood. Maybe it is giving them the pleasure that they need. They would rather run away from the truth, hold on to that thing, and oppose anything that will expose whatever they are doing. And so this was uh, the life that the Pharisees were actually embraced in. The light that was in Christ Jesus was exposing their sinful nature. And the best they could do was to rise up and fight against him so that their deeds, their sinful deeds may not be exposed. Because the moment Christ exposed them, that means that they were going to lose a following. People were going to turn to Christ and for them, they would actually be losers. And so the four things that I have hi highlighted, friends, that promoted the unbelief of the Pharisees are their attitude towards Christ, their obsession with their religion, lack of unexperienced knowledge of Christ Jesus, but also uh, sin. Now, friends, the result of the Pharisees' unbelief is that they rejected Christ and they remained in their state of darkness. Unbelief, friends, manifests itself in different ways. We could be there. You know, these Pharisees were always also gathered within you know, the congregation that was with Christ Jesus. Sometimes, we tend to think that because we are in the number, it is well with our souls. Because we are walking together with, you know, God's people. We always attend fellowship. We do all the things that we are required to do as Christians. It is well with our souls. But there could be some elements of unbelief in our lives, friends, that at the end of it all, as we walk, we reach a point where Christ will actually say he never knew us. It will be so painful, friends. How does unbelief manifest in our lives in today's church, friends? One of the ways that it manifests itself is leaning on our own understanding instead of yielding to God. There are people who say that they have their own truth. Yes, they belong to the congregation, they do everything that others are doing. But as far as their life is concerned, nothing is about to change them. There are things that they hold unto and they say that this is what I believe in. Now, it is good if what you believe in is the truth. But if what you believe in is not the truth and you're leaning on your own understanding, child of God, that tantamounts to rebellion. It is an element of darkness. Much as you are within the congregation of God's people, if you do not uh, you know, yield yourself to everything that Christ teaches us to follow, you only maybe believe certain things, but other things you, you refuse to believe. That is a condition of unbelief. Because if you truly believe in Christ, you are not going to be, you know, a half Christian who believes certain things and then other things you, you, you lay them off because they do not align with your interests, your desires, you know, but you only hold on to things that, you know, you, you want to, uh, things that gratify your desires as an individual. And so leaning on our own understanding is something that could be highlighting a state of unbelief. If there are certain things that we refuse concerning the truth of the Lord because they just don't align with our interest, let us check out, friends. The other thing is syncretism. Syncretism is a mixture of different religious beliefs. You know, you could be holding on to the Christian faith, but also there are some cultural things that you, you still hold so dear even if you know that they are against the truth of God. Now, when we embrace these cultural things and we add them to our faith, that mixture actually highlights 
a state, a condition of unbelief in Christ Jesus. Because our God is a jealous God. He says he will never share his glory with any other. So if there are different doctrines that we have embraced and we think that it is okay, we can add them to our faith, then we are deceiving ourselves because we can never enjoy the light that is in Christ Jesus. Another one is, you know, there are some times that we go through certain experiences here under the sun, but then you reach a point where you compromise, you surrender to that circumstance, you surrender to that condition. Maybe you have waited for a partner for long, and now, you know, anybody comes, you know, may, maybe let, let's say somebody who is... Uh, not a believer at all, a pagan, but because you have waited upon the Lord and you thought God would bring this right person and he has not done it, then later on, maybe in, in disappointment, you just decide to go with anybody and you say that, after all, I tried, I prayed, I did all that I could have done, but God, I think, you know, did not just listen to me. And because of that, you decide to take your own path. Friends, that is a sign of unbelief. When we yield to the circumstances that we find ourselves in, we, instead of waiting patiently upon the Lord, we surrender to those situations. It could be highlighting a state, a condition of unbelief in our hearts. Also, the love for worldly things. As others are sacrificing their resources for the sake of God, for you, you are actually sacrificing godly things for worldly pleasures. If it is time to, you know, to come for service and you have this party, this happening, you would rather go and party and leave the things of God. You do not hold the things of God de so dearly that you can easily let go. And then you do things which are contrary to the truth. Maybe because you belong to this particular group of people and they, you, know, you know that they are not believers and the things that they do are not actually right. But because you want to continue being their friends, you are forced to do things with them that are not right. That is a sign of unbelief friends because there is no way you will enjoy life there and then tomorrow again you come to church and say that you are, you know, you are a child of God, worshiping God in truth and in spirit. Your life is actually messed up. And some of us don't see any wrong in some of the things. We go outside there, we, we mingle with all categories of people. We do different things that are not in accordance to God's will. But later on, we come to church with all this filth in our lives, but we cannot see any problem with it at all. Friends, we could be, you know, uh, leading ourselves into a state of unbelief against God. And also, spiritual blindness. You know, spiritual blindness comes in when you have not yielded your heart unto the Lord. You look at things from the way the people in the world look at things. You do not have the spirit of discernment to help you see what is good, what is right to embrace, and what is not right. And so all your judgments are based uh, on worldly things. That is why Jesus Christ told these people in verse 15, you judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the father who sent me. And so these Pharisees, they based their judgments on their carnal minds on human standards, they did not allow the spirit of God to take preeminence. Friends, if God's spirit does not abide in you, whatever it is that you are going to do, even if you feel that you are on the right path, it will be deception. The Bible says that there is a way that seems right to man, but at the end, it leads to, to death. This is a condition that, uh, you know, defines those who do not put their hope and trust in the Lord, those who do not actually believe in God. They always think they are doing the right thing, but at the end, they are disappointed. You walk in blindness. And so friends, what are the dangers of unbelief? 
as we have seen in the life of the Pharisees, of course, they opposed the light. They rejected the light. They rejected the truth. And they continued in their state of darkness. John chapter 3 and verse 18 and 19 says, John 3 from 18 says, whoever, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Now, the writer of John says that we stand condemned if we walk in unbelief. If we fail to believe in the Son, then we are already condemned. Friends, Jesus Christ did not come to the world to condemn, but he came to save. But because of unbelief, when we fail to believe in him, we stand condemned already. This is what unbelief does. The Pharisees stood condemned by virtue of their unbelief in Christ Jesus. I pray that none of us will stand condemned simply because we have failed to believe in the Lord. Friends, unbelief is of darkness. It is not of light. If we fail to embrace Jesus Christ, we have agreed to embrace darkness. And because we have agreed to embrace darkness, we stand condemned because there is no middle line between darkness and light. Praise the Lord. And also, the other thing is that we forfeit God's rest. Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews also chapter 3 from 18 highlights something concerning the rest of God that actually the wilderness wanderers missed out. In verse 18 it says, And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Friends, the Israelites, because of their unbelief, God made the that left to enter into the promised land. They made, God made them to perish within the wilderness. When Moses sent 12 spies to spy the land of Canaan and took back report, 10 of them were contrary. They said, yes, the land is a good land flowing with milk and honey, but we cannot go there because we have giants there. We are going to perish. You know, we looked like grasshoppers before them. And so their unbelief made God to swear that they would not enter that land. But, you know, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, who brought back a positive report and they had faith in the Lord. And so, friends, when we have unbelief, there is no way we can expect to have rest from God. This rest is not only about eternity, spending eternity with our Lord Jesus Christ, but also in this life. There is a way God gives his children rest over the different issues that surround us, that we, we confront on a daily basis, because we know that God is in charge. We know that he is our shepherd, we learn to rest in him. We surrender the burdens unto him. But when we do not believe in him, we try to use our human efforts, our wisdom, our strength to handle those situations. And as we use all the things, we forfeit that rest that God gives to his children because we think we know, we think we can get our ways out on our own. We struggle, but at the end of it all still, we fail. And that is how deadly unbelief is, friends. It always makes you to focus on your strength, on your knowledge, on your, you know, on your power. But our power, our strength is limited. It cannot do anything, friends. But if you are a person who does not believe, you will always work it your own way. And you will always fail. You will not have rest. As God is actually granting his beloved a rest. I pray that we shall not forfeit God's rest just because of unbelief. And so friends, with unbelief, we walk in defiance of God. We despise the 
sacrifice that Christ actually made for us at the cross. And we continue to look for a way to quench our, you know, that inward desire, which actually cannot be quenched by anything else but faith in Christ Jesus. If we continue with the state of unbelief, thinking that we are going to find solutions in any other source, it shall not be possible. It is only when we return to Christ that our hearts will be at rest. And so the Pharisees missed out because of the unbelief that they had. This unbelief separated them from God. This unbelief detached them from walking with Christ, from following Christ, from embracing the light that actually uh, came through Christ Jesus. Are there things, traits in our lives that may show us that we are actually walking against the will of the Lord? We are actually doing things that are in defiance to God's will. It is a call upon us to cross-check our lives. And if there is any condition that may highlight and believe, we need to surrender unto the Lord. I love this man who approached Jesus Christ concerning his son in Mark chapter 9, the gospel according to St. Mark, the chapter 9. I'll just read verses 23 and uh, 24. This man came to, he first brought his son to the disciples, but they were not able to cast away the spirit. And then later on, he came to Jesus Christ. And Jesus told him in verse 23, Mark 9, 23. If you can, say Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Friends, the only way to overcome unbelief is to surrender to Christ Jesus and ask for his help. This man said, yes, I believe. But if there is any trace of unbelief in me, Lord, help me to overcome it. Because he realized that on his own, he may not be able to overcome. And so I pray that today, even as we ref continue to reflect on this, if there are things in our lives that possibly could, could have been pulling us away from God. There are doubts that we had that were driving us away from God's presence. May we return to God and ask him that, Lord, this doubt today, I surrender it unto you. I do not want to, to, to be taken into a state of unbelief where my heart is total against your will, O oh God. May you help me overcome this state of unbelief. And God is faithful. When we surrender unto him, he will obviously hearken unto our prayers and he will help us overcome that state of unbelief. I pray that God helps each and every one of us to walk in faith because without faith, we cannot please God. Unbelief is an element of darkness. Where there is unbelief, you cannot you know, uh, experience you know, the promises of God coming to pass in your life. Where there is unbelief, you always doubt the things of God and you don't, you know, you don't take any risk at all concerning the things of faith. You will always be running away from it. But where there is faith, you take every kind of risk as far as it is for the good of the light, the gospel that we ought unto. May the Lord bless us. Thank you. Let's pray. Eternal King of glory, we praise and exalt your holy name, O God. You require that we should not walk in ignorance, O God. But sometimes we are caught up in that because of unbelief. Even when we go to church every day, even when we pray, O God, sometimes the enemy makes certain areas in our in our lives, oh God, to be totally closed from your truth. But where such elements could be, Lord, we pray that may you help us overcome them, that our hearts may totally be yielded unto you and that you will take over 
and reign above everything else, oh God, to the glory, praise, and honor of your name, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you so much, Reverend, for sharing with us the heart of God this morning. Um, I want us to pray in a few minutes as we meditate on these words. To each one of us, what we have heard, the questions should be, what is my attitude towards God and the things of God? What's my obsession for the things that are around me? What's my obsession for the religious practices? What am I defending that is blinding me from experiencing the light of Christ? And then we'll ask for forgiveness that the Lord helps us to forgive us that anything in us that is leading us to have and believe any sin because Hebrews 11, 6 says without faith, we cannot believe. We cannot please God, sorry. And so let's just bless the Lord this morning. Father, we thank you for sending us your word through Reverend Walter. We give you glory for using how King of glory. We thank you that you have spoken unto us. You have rebuked us. You have Hold us back to order. And so we come, O King of Kings, asking that you have mercy on us this morning, that even as we have heard this word, it will affect us, O King of Kings. Help us, you who search as the hearts and the innermost of hearts, Lord. Search our hearts this morning, that for every thing that is in us that is not of you, that is causing us not to have faith in you, not to stand, O King of Kings, we pray that you will have mercy on us this morning. Have mercy, Lord, on our attitudes that have brought us to just criticize, O King of Glory. Have mercy on us, O Lord, my Master, for our obsessions, for religion, and forgetting, O Lord, the power that you have shown to us through the cross of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray this morning that as we walk out of this place, even as we meditate on this word, that you will help our unbelief as, as, as we've had the man who asks for, for, for Christ in Mark 9, 23 and 24. Help our unbelief this morning because you speak to help us transform. May you help us this morning, Lord, even as we commit our lives to you, that we shall follow, we shall detach ourselves from anything that is bringing unbelief in us. We ask that you help us because on our own, we need you to point us to those areas where we need to turn, where we have mixed our cultures, where we have mixed up faith with many other things and we have reasoned out lord we pray that you have mass on us but you help point us O king of glory to the to the to the place O lord my master where we shall walk and please you in our faith where we shall know you and we shall have a hold of you practically not through what we have read, not what we have heard from others, because we, we even realize that when we don't believe, even those around us cannot believe, because what we spread to them is the unbelief that we have. And so we pray that you will help us, that we shall even help those around us, oh my master. Father, we thank you and we bless you. I pray, O oh King of glory, that you disperse us, O oh King of kings, as we meditate on this word, O oh King of glory, that you will help us grow in faith, that the things that blind us, O oh my master, that keep us in darkness, will be wiped away by your light. And so we speak your light to shine in our hearts this morning, that your light of Christ will shine in our works, in our jobs, even as we go to work. Let your light shine in our families, oh my master, that we shall continue believing and having faith in you. And we shall follow you till that day when you come, O oh King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, we want to pray a blessing over Reverend Walter, that you will watch over him, over what concerns him. You'll take care of it, that you will cover him. There will be no backlash. There will be no 
turning point or king of glory where he asks, where is the God that I serve? That you will supply all his needs according to your riches as according to your word. And to everyone on the call, Lord, my master, I speak and minister unto their hearts and their spirits and souls that even as they go, that you will answer the questions that they have, that those who need, O king of glory, to feel your hand, that you will release and touch them because your hand is not shortened and you're the one who can help. You're the helper to the help bless O Lord. Father, help us, guide us, and lead us. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Amen. Amen.